Greetings adventures and welcome to ADV in Japan. So today we are going to be talking about the low fuel lights on the KTM 390 Adventure. More specifically today I'm going to be bleeding this thing dry. I'm literally going to uh, use every single drop of fuel inside this tank and I want to see how many kilometers I can get from the time that the low fuel light comes on until I use that last teeny tiny uh, drip of fuel. Now I know what you're thinking, this is gonna kill my fuel pump. I understand that. Um, I do actually, uh, kind of oddly enough, I do have a reserve fuel pump sitting in uh, my shed. So if that is the case, I can go ahead and throw that sucker in there and I'll be good to go. So do not try this at home. Obviously they recommend that you fill the gas tank uh, once it starts getting below halfway, just to reduce the stress on that fuel pump. But I'm doing this for you guys, uh, more so just for my own interest actually. This wasn't going to be a YouTube video until I found out just how crazy this experiment was getting. So for those of you that are interested in this kind of content and you wanna see just how, uh, how many kilometers you can get on that reserve fuel, then just go ahead and skip to the end. You can find out, it's pretty easy. Um, but if you stick around, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, give you guys some tips on how I got so many miles, uh, so many kilometers out of this res reserve fuel. Um, just tips on how to preserve that fuel until you get to the next gas station. And if I have even more time, because I think I got about 30 to 40 kilometers left on this thing, uh, then I'll go ahead and share some footage from a vacation that I took up in Nagano, where I had the privilege of finally, after so many years of living in this country, uh, to go see the snow monkeys uh, up in uh, the Shimo Onsen area. All right, so without further ado, let's quite literally get the show on the road. Okay, you guys, so I'm not quite sure if you can see that, but uh, as you see, I've got the low fuel light on here, and unbelievably, I've got 105.6 kilometers on this reserve fuel. So what do I mean by reserve fuel? Reserve fuel is the fuel that is left in the tank once this low fuel light comes on. That's a ridiculous amount. It's way more than I've seen people quote on YouTube or on uh, Facebook or any of the forums for KTM 390 Adventure. I'm not sure if this is a newer thing for the newer TFT, but um, there's a fuel range thing on here as well too. And it says that I still have, uh, you know, I have less than 40 kilometers left. And I also want to see how accurate this is as well, too. And I also want to see how detailed it gets. Does it actually go all the way down to like one kilometer left, less than one kilometer? Um, so yeah, pretty interested in this. As you know, in Hokkaido, I ran into a situation where I was uh, out of fuel, pretty much, or where this light came on at night and I was in the middle of nowhere and it scared the crap out of me only to find out that when I got to the gas station I had 2.5 liters in the tank and I had been riding probably about 20-30 minutes on this low fuel light so pretty shocking there and it basically uh, you know I, I wanted to at some point just push this bike to the max and see exactly how many kilometers I can get out of this reserve fuel so that's exactly what we're going to do today and I'm going to give you guys some tips on how to uh, preserve as much of that fuel as you can in order to get yourself to the gas station with gas in the tank. Okay, so um, I'm gonna give you these tips in order of operation. So when that light first comes on, what do you do? A lot of it's gonna be pretty much common sense for you guys, I know that, I understand. A lot of you guys are pretty smart out there, you know what you're doing. Uh, some of us don't, and so this information is for you. And you know, some of you experts out there might learn something too as well. This comes from my own research, my own experience as well. So, you know, I hope you guys can get something out of it. Okay, so first thing, always have some spare fuel. I've got a 900 milliliter fuel tank in here ready to go. So when this happens today, I can pop this in and I've got nearly a liter of fuel, which means I've got roughly about 30 kilometers. So plenty of plenty of time and, and uh, kilometers to get where I need to go uh, to get to a gas station. So first things first, once you start seeing this light, you need to get to a safe area and pull the bike over. And that's because you need to uh, plan your route out to the gas station. You don't wanna be doing that while you're driving the bike, obviously. Now this is quite situational, uh, but when you're planning your routes, uh, it's best to avoid highways, and that's because they're obviously dangerous. If you, in the event you do uh, lose power to the bike due to a lack of fuel, you don't want to be stuck on the highway with those fast cars whizzing by. Typically the shoulders are really small. Just ask any cop 
they'll tell you it's not safe at all. It also makes it harder for safety crews to get out to you if you need to get the bike towed. If you're already on the highway, obviously, and you know there's gonna be a fuel stop soon, then you're fine. Just do what you gotta do there. This is in situations where you're in the middle of nowhere and you gotta get to a gas station that you don't know where the nearest one is in sight. All right, so once you've got your route planned out, uh, the next thing you need to make sure is make sure that your tires are properly inflated. This is gonna reduce friction and you know it's just gonna give you that much more uh, fuel when you're on the road. So again, you know, if you were just off road, get on road, air those tires up, and then hit the road. Okay, so with that said, let's go ahead and get on the road here. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, start her up. All right, so let's go ahead and get on the road. I'm gonna show you the kind of road that you wanna stay on. So I mentioned avoid the highways, so you're probably wondering, well, what, where am I gonna ride then? What am I gonna do? The best kind of roads you wanna be on are roads that have either, um, a large sidewalk for you able to pull over to, um, a large shoulder, um, or you know, just driveways that you can get in, get yourself off the road and uh, into a safe area where safety crews can access you. You can get your bike towed. Uh, the other thing too is make sure that you're on a road that doesn't have a lot of lights or traffic. Uh, and the reason for that is because, uh, as I'll explain later, you want to avoid idling. It's the worst thing you can do. It's the most inefficient use of fuel on a motorcycle because you're using fuel and you're not moving. So once you get going like I am now, um, you wanna maintain your speed. So no sudden bursts and none of that showing off, no wheelies. A lot of the stuff is common sense, you guys. I understand that, but a lot of times what we'll do is we'll panic when fuel runs low, like I did in Hokkaido, I was freaking out. And that's the worst thing you can do because aggressive panic driving will consume a lot more fuel than relaxed, calm and consistent riding so if you've got it like i do use uh, a throttle lock whatever if you got cruise control put the cruise control on and cruise at a nice stable speed you're also going to want to shift sooner than later because you want to avoid higher rpms obviously higher rpms will reduce um, will increase fuel consumption so using those higher gears shifting sooner and obviously when you get a situation where you need to brake, pull the clutch in immediately, do not use engine braking. Uh, I know it's something it's something of a habit, something that I do too as well. Um, it's a good habit to have, you know, if you wanna save your brakes for sure, but it's a habit that will consume fuel um, if you do that. So definitely do not engine brake, pull the clutch in as soon as you need to brake. This means that you're also gonna make sure that you're in the proper gear uh, for the proper speed, the appropriate speed as well too. Again, we are shifting earlier than usual. So typically I'll shift like right around, you know, 4,000 RPMs here when I'm in this kind of a situation. Whereas on a normal situation, I would shift much, much higher, probably around five and a half to 6,000 RPMs. And then for really aggressive driving off road, even higher than that. So, Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and pull up to a light here and again, just demonstrate another technique that will help you avoid you know, losing unnecessary fuel. So you're, unfortunately you come to a point where you've got a light and you've got to stop at that light and you know it's, it's gonna be, you know, over 30 seconds to a minute. Then what you can do is just go ahead and pull the clutch in, hit the kill switch, kill the engine, use your brakes to go ahead and slow the bike down. Make sure you put that kill switch back on. So again, you can just start the bike right back up and you're good to go. Again, making sure that you're in the appropriate gear for that speed. It's a different kind of driving, you guys. It definitely is. If you are used to engine braking, uh, which is what I do, you know that you're always in the appropriate gear. Uh, but when you're in this conservative style of driving, trying to, to save as much fuel as you can, uh, then, you know, obviously you've got to change up your driving style. Another technique that you guys can do that uh, I've done a little bit while I've been doing this experiment is uh, to use aerodynamic riding techniques. So you know, the kind of techniques that, that uh, you know, racing MotoGP, MotoGP guys use, and that's putting your head behind the windshield, especially if you are against the wind, as I am right now. So putting your head behind here, you'll notice an immediate effect on the reduced buffeting. And this will again, save more fuel.
I almost did it. I almost did my engine brake in there, you guys. All right, so I am at currently at a hundred and whoa, what's going on here? Oh, I guess somebody's taking a left turn. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and kill the engine. You don't want to cycle the key. That takes way too much time. So just hit the kill switch, turn it back on. You'd be good to go. So again, I know I'm gonna be here for a while, so I'm gonna kill the engine. And let it sit. And you know, having done this, uh, you know, I've been employing this over the last hundred kilometers. And I think that's precisely why I've been able to get 100, over 100 kilometers out of this reserve fuel here. So one of the other reasons why I'm doing it this way, you guys, is because I want to give you the maximum, you know, amount of fuel efficiency here so that you can use this as a guide, depending on the conditions that you're in, where you're at, uh, the kind of riding that you're going to be doing, your load. So I've got kind of a conservative load here. I would say it's probably about 60 to 70% of my max load that I'll go on an adventure ride. So, you know, what you see here, the final result that you see here will hopefully give you an idea of what the most ideal situation, like the best case scenario, the furthest case scenario, stretching that fuel as far as you possibly can. And then again, just gauge that based on you know judge that based on where you are and the riding conditions that you're in your payload and all that stuff and you get a decent idea of you know how many kilometers you've got left in the tank now again we've got this fuel range indicator on the tft display but i don't know how accurate that is we're going to find out and if it is accurate then well there's really no math to do at all you just have to pay attention to that fuel left in the tank that fuel range indicator so we got some time so i'm gonna actually do some errands here <laughs> this little experiment here is crazy i'm gonna go pick up some uh some sweet potato i don't put a smile on the wife's face here because i probably won't get home until a little bit late tonight All right, so back on the road here. The other thing too, you know, is just, you know, if you know that you're down to the line here, you've barely got any fuel, you know, that uh, fuel range indicator is telling you you've got like five kilometers left or something or whatever. Just keep yourself aware, you know, checking your mirrors once in a while, seeing what's behind you, because as soon as the engine cuts, you're gonna lose power. You're gonna need to pull over. Keep your eyes peeled for a good place to kind of put the bike over. So your situational awareness needs to be, you know, at its top, top of the game. So very little traffic, as you can see, this is a great place to be cruising. There's no lights. You know, I can go at a fairly decent pace, consistent pace, that's important. So we're at 125 kilometers, uh, it says uh, I've got a fuel range of about 10 kilometers left, so at any moment here, this engine should cut. So I've got a little bit more time, so I'll go ahead and uh, tell you guys about my trip. Uh, in the corner there, I'll go ahead and leave this uh, the TFT on display there, so you guys can keep track of what happens here when it when it cuts. So yeah, over the weekend, I had a fantastic opportunity. Uh, a long-awaited opportunity to get up to go see the snow monkeys up in Nagano. It's probably one of the most picturesque places in Japan, at least on the top 10, I would say. It's a beautiful area. It's not only famous for monkeys, though. It is famous also for hot springs, obviously. With the monkeys in those hot springs, they are enjoying the beauty of that area as well, too. The hot springs in this area, particularly in the Shibu Onsen area, are just to die for. Really, really awesome. There's a small little village area um, called Shibu Onsen, and it's a strip of hotels that um, are in a really, really, uh, you know, kind of hot spot for hot springs. And uh, what you do is you make a reservation for the hotel, as we did. 
you can go cheap or expensive. You know, uh, cheap is probably somewhere around 100 bucks per person. That includes meals, so breakfast and dinner included for one night. Or you can go on the expensive end. Uh, you know, one of the hotels there is actually uh, quite famous as it served as inspiration to Hayao Miyazaki's uh, film, the uh, Sento Chihiro. I forgot the English title, it slipped my mind, you guys, sorry, but um, that uh, hot spring hotel in that movie was inspired by this beautiful, beautiful hotel that's located in Shibohonsen. So you could stay there, but it's gonna cost you a couple hundred bucks per person, if not more. And if it's during the busy season, it'll be pretty, pretty expensive, but definitely a unique experience for sure. I've never been in there before. I've been in the lobby, but so that's about it. Um, but we stayed in a cheaper hotel, a little bit further north than that. And what they do is, as soon as you check in, they'll take you to the room to kind of show you around. They'll give you a little map. I'm sure they have an English map as well too, maybe a couple other languages. And the map is gonna show you all the locations of private hot springs that are located uh, behind locked door. Um, and so they're gonna give you a master key that's gonna unlock all of those. So it's pretty cool. Um, they'll give you a set of yukatas, and if you don't know what a yukata is, it's essentially, um, it's kind of like, um, like an evening gown, I, I'd say, kind of an evening dress down kind of pajama. A light kimono that you wear and it's just easy to take on and off so you know as you're walking around the town and you're accessing these private baths uh, you can easily take off the yukata put it back on and you're good to go um, so each bath is numbered I believe there are nine in total and it's kind of a you know a goal of, of some Japanese to you know hit all nine of these within a period of a few days or you know, in some extreme cases, maybe one day. And so, yeah, pretty pretty cool experience. The hot springs were incredibly hot. Um, yeah, I, I can't remember the name of one of the hot spring areas around there, but it's like Hell's Gate or something like that. But um, yeah, the, the hot spring temperature in this area can get up to 50, past 50 degrees Celsius. That is insane hot. That'll burn your skin if you get in. So in all these little private hot springs, they'll have little uh, like water spigots and it has access to cold water. So you can cool the, the water down before you actually get in, as you can see here. Thankfully, uh, this one was empty. So I was able to actually get some footage of one of the private hot springs. And it, I mean, people have been bathing in these private hot springs for hundreds of years, you guys. Just it's an incredible rich history in this area. It's a beautiful area. Even just walking around the town, you can just see it's just inundated with history, culture, just amazing. And as I mentioned, uh, this area is also famous for the snow monkeys, and that's about a thirty-minute, um, about a thirty-minute walk from uh, kind of the Shiba Onsen area. You can either uh, take your car up, and they'll force you to park a little bit early before the actual area. So it takes about twenty minutes for you to walk to the staging area where you begin the hike up to the mountain or you could take a bus i believe they have a bus from the hotel that will get you even closer like right at the base of the mountain and then from there you make your hike up and that's about a 10 minute hike so you're going to want to plan in a little bit of time uh you know for for you to actually get up there and see the monkeys and get there as early as you can earlier the better and of course, winter is the most famous time because, well, uh, you've got you've got the snow, the quintessential snow and stuff. But not just that, the monkeys actually will, um, during the warmer months, they'll go further up the mountain, higher elevation, just to stay cooler. It's the colder months, obviously, that you know they stay down in this little onsen area. Uh, just a word of caution, though, if you do go in the winter time, definitely make sure that you bring. Um, some uh gosh i don't <laughs> i don't know what they're called in english shoe spikes uh i know the japanese aizen but i don't know what the, the english is shoe spike these, these are the kind of words you guys you forget first because you just don't use them 
Um, so yeah, make sure you've got a pair of those. If you don't, then uh, you can rent them. There's a little station where you can actually rent them and I definitely recommend it. When I was there, there was ice everywhere, all over the path. Very, very icy. And also um, the, and on the way, I almost slipped a couple times. I saw a couple people just biff really hard. One lady hit her head pretty hard. She was a bit dazzled, but um, the worst one was a dad had actually slipped and hit his kid into a, into a freezing stream. And it was nuts, man. Like kids are just, you know, it just takes them a little while to figure out what's going on. He must've been like three or four years old and, and he just got bumped into this little stream and he went in butt first and uh, you know, I'd seen him go in and, and he just was like, he's sitting in there like a foot of water with his rear end in there looking up and he just looked at me and it took him about two or three seconds before he realized what the heck happened. And the, uh, the tears just started streaming. So we ripped him out of there. We just jumped in and got him out of there real quick. And yeah, so definitely you wanna, you wanna bring something uh, for traction. And I had great hiking boots that day. So, and still I was slipping all over the place. Another word of caution too is on the way, there is, um, <laughs> there is a hot spring hotel on the hiking trail. And uh, you may run the chance of uh, seeing some naked Japanese dudes <laughs> because the male side is completely exposed to the hiking trail. Uh, when I was there, there were two old guys and I was, I was amazed. I was like, dude, that takes some nuts, like quite literally. <laughs> So two guys totally butt naked. Uh, sorry for you guys out there. The ladies side is completely covered and concealed. I don't know what's up with that. But if I was that, I mean, if I was staying there, heck no, I would be. <laughs> it's like you got tours from all over the world just watching you. Uh, it's, you know, it's a good fair amount of way though. It's about a football field away. So it's not like you get all the, the nice neat, nitty little gritty details. But uh, yeah, so you hike up there. It takes about 10 minutes and once you get there, uh, it's, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty cool, man. It's going to take some time for you to probably dig through the crowd and get the shot that you want. So you may want to bring like a selfie stick. You can pop it over everyone and, and get that shot that you want. Um, but, uh, just amazing to watch these monkeys. They're so not even close to humans in terms of, you know, the evolution spectrum. I mean, they're, they're a distant cousin. They can hardly even use tools. Um, but, you know, when they get into a bath, you guys, I'm telling you, it's like, it's a spitting image. Like, even some of the poses that they do are just like something you'll see, like some old grandpa. <laughs> He's just chilling in a, in a, in a hot spring. And of course, you know, the kids, just like human kids, are playing around in the water, they're having fun, splashing around, and mom and dad are like, hey, quit that, cut it out. So, just, uh, just a really cool, a really cool time. So, you know, once you hit the main hot spring area and get your pictures, don't forget to head down into the river area. Um, you can also see some of the monkeys interacting with each other. There are tons and tons of little groups that you know little gangs of monkeys that have their own little territories and you can see them fighting stuff um and you know obviously they're used to humans so they will walk very close to you they'll walk by you and around you and stuff and just ignore them don't look them in the eye you know as the signs will notate just keep your own business uh, you can take shots but you know don't you don't want to be like getting in their face um when i was uh in a different area same monkeys but a different area I had uh, tried to get a shot of one of the babies and so I approached the mom with the baby in the back. I got a little too close and one of those male, kind of the male dominant monkeys just came over at me and just about ripped my freaking face off. So you definitely don't want to get in their way. Just let them be, let them do their thing and, and uh, take pictures of them in their, their natural element, their natural state. Don't try to force yourself in there. So yeah, just a great experience. Got some good shots as you guys can see. And uh, just headed back. It was a, a, a great little one night trip there and just had fun. It was... All right, you guys. So as you can see on the fuel range, it says zero kilometers. 
So I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and hit hit the uh, I'm gonna kill the engine actually. I'm gonna hit the um, the trip monitor and I'm gonna see how many kilometers you get from zero. So uh, let's reset this one. All right. So let's leave. Yeah, let's leave this on. And then we're going to see how many kilometers we get with zero fuel range zero. Boy, this is good timing because I'm about ready to hit a, a storm here. Any second here, you guys, this engine's going to cut. Now, I've never done this before because, well, I've never wanted to do it. And I've never had a YouTube channel before. So <laughs> this should be quite interesting when it happens. It'll be new to me. But that's what I'm here for is to show you guys, you know, what happens. And yeah, just so you don't have to go through it. And if you do, then at least you've seen me go through it. Ah, ah. I thought I felt, I thought I felt something. Yeah, this may, it, it may be close, you guys. It may be close. Yeah, when I, uh, you know, you know you're out of trouble when, when you lean the bike and then it starts, you know, when you start losing power on turns, because the the fuel pump has so little fuel in it. Now the fuel pump on the KTM 390 is dead center at the bottom of the tank, obviously, so that it can soak up every single drip of fuel before you're out. Uh, but that means, you know, if you're really super low like I am right now and you, you make a hard turn, uh, it may kill the engine. So, uh, as soon as I get that, I'm going to go ahead and stop and fill up because I don't want to put too much stress on my pump. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. There it is, you guys. 11.7 kilometers on the tank. Let me go ahead and get myself off to a, a safer area here. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and, and get off the bike here. I'm going to go ahead and push her over to a, uh, a little grassy area up, up, up ahead here. Good. All right, let's take a look at the uh, odometer here. So, okay, so you guys take a look here at uh, trip one. So this is the total kilometers that I was able to get on a low fuel light. 145.2 kilometers. Um, my fuel conservation was about 31.7 kilometers per liter. Let's go ahead and take a look at uh, how many of that 140-ish uh, so 11.8, so as soon as, as the fuel range gets to zero, you've got 11.8 kilometers still left in the tank. So there it is, folks. That's pretty impressive. So, um, let's go ahead and, uh, let's go ahead and get the fuel in the tank here. All right. Now this is um, about 900 milliliters. So at my current consumption rate of about 30 kilometers per per liter, that means I'm going to get about 20, 25 more kilometers out of this. So for a total of around 160, that'll get me so far. In Japan, there's absolutely no reason why, anywhere in Japan at least, there's there's really no reason why uh, you should run out of fuel with this bike. Even if you didn't have a spare tank. And of course, to make this real, we're going to go ahead and go to a, fuel, uh, to a, um, a gas stand. And I'm going to go fill her up the rest of the way. Alright you guys, so when you go to start the engine, make sure that... Um, you hear that sound? 
just let that happen so you don't want to immediately start the bike up i would recycle it a couple times and you can hear the uh, you know the fuel pump is going to be sucking fuel in there and then you can go ahead and give her a good start before you get the bike on the road good make sure she turns over Now I'm actually kind of nervous because I actually don't have any fuel left, like no spare fuel. So <laughs> I'm, I should be fine though. I think the, you know, the gas stand here I'm heading to is just about four, four kilometers out. And I know I've got more than four kilometers worth of fuel in the tank. So should be good to go. And there she is. The proverbial water hole in the desert for motorcycles, the gas stand. All right. We are salad, you guys. So I'm gonna go ahead and fill up here and obviously don't forget to fill up your spare tank while you're at it too. There it is, you guys. 14.7 liters. <laughs> I used every single drip in this tank. Oh my goodness. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, fill up my spare tank here as well. Perfect, he's actually one liter. That's great. So I think it's, I think on the on the can it says like a like 900 milliliters, 980 milliliters. So got a full liter in here. That's great. So I know that I've got a liter there, and I know that I've got um, 14 liters in here. So I got about 15 liters total. All right, she's a happy camper. I'll tell you what. All right, you guys, so that's it. Thanks for sticking around to the end here. So just kind of a quick recap of some of the highlights here. So I got about 145 kilometers once the, you know, from the time the light came on and the engine died. Uh, another key finding is that the fuel range indicator is not accurate, but it's not accurate in a good way because uh, on my count, it gave me an extra 11.7, I think it was, uh, an extra 11.7 kilometers. Okay, you guys, that is it. Uh, I hope this was helpful. If it was, go ahead and smash that like and subscribe button. And uh, yeah, you know how it goes. Until next time, this is ADV in Japan. Out. Yeah.